Take out your Bibles. Yeah. I got mine here too. Uh, what we're going to do this morning, the title of the message is When a Man Sees God. When someone really has an experience with God, how do you know it? Well, are there ever experiences that people have that are not with God? Yeah. Are there ever experiences that people have that they think are from God but are really not from God? Yes, sir. A lot of them. Probably more than, than the other guy. Uh, to be an experience from God, there's uh, it has to meet the Bible conditions. There's Bible conditions to a real experience with God. In fact, everyone who gets saved has had an experience with God, not where really they've seen God in this sense. But they go through these same steps, these same things. That's an experience with salvation. Believe me, salvation is an experience with God. But there's a lot of false ones going out, out there now, and they don't meet the Bible definition. They don't qualify biblically as to a real experience with God. With God. There's four in particular. I'm going to read from three of them, but there's four in particular. Number one, Job had experience with God in the Old Testament, didn't they? He had a real experience with God. Secondly, we'll be reading about this one. This will be the first one, Exodus chapter 3. Exodus. So you might turn there if you would, Exodus chapter 3. A second one that experienced with God is Moses. A third one that experienced with God is Paul. And a fourth one that experienced with God is Isaiah. Now I'm going to be reading from Moses' experience and Paul's experience and Isaiah's experience. I'll get into Job's experience a little further around in the message if I remember, if I remember that. But right now in Exodus chapter 3. Now, to have an experience with God, it has to follow the Bible criteria. Just because someone had some kind of experience doesn't mean it was with uh, the God of the Bible. You have to understand that. There's false experiences and because there is a deceiver out there. Yes. There is a counterfeiter out there. There is a spiritual counterfeiter out there. And everything that God has, he counterfeits. But his counterfeits are never real. Make sure you know the difference. Have you had an experience with God? People say they have an experience with God. You're that young boy, suppose he went to heaven, saw heaven, came back, and told about that. Well, there's a problem with that in the Bible. And the Apostle Paul says it's not lawful to tell about those things. He saw some things in heaven, and things in heaven that it's not lawful to talk about. So you're not supposed to talk about those things. Lazarus died. He came back to life. What did he have to say about it? Nothing. Not one word is recorded about Lazarus dying, being resurrected from the dead, and then, of course, dying a second time, too, after that. Four people had experiences with God, and they compare in their conditions. Job, Moses, Paul, and Isaiah. Let's read, first of all, from Moses, though. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro's father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Oreb. And the angel of the Lord, here, here's experience with God. The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So he's seeing something here supernatural. That's involved in salvation. Experience has got supernatural things. Yeah. Amen. Verse 4 brings up an interesting thought. It's not my main thought or part of the message this morning, but it's an important one to remember. I might even, even preach a message on this one thought. Verse 4 says, And when the Lord saw, he turned aside to see. When the Lord saw Moses' reaction to seeing the fiery furnace, when God saw how Moses reacted to what he saw, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. In other words, if Moses had not turned aside to see what was going on here, God would have not called him. Moses had to turn aside and see, follow up on this, this sight that he had, and this experience that he had seeing this burning bush. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday a lot of people went through the, this type of experience. 
They were presented with things from the Bible, from our people on the street. They heard things, they saw things, they took some out of literature home. Now, God is watching them to see how they're going to respond to what they saw, heard, and read from yesterday. How are they going to respond? If they respond the right way, God will continue to work in the life. If they choose not to respond, it's a dead end. That's where it stops. What a good thought, isn't it? Now verse 4 again. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God saw his reaction, Moses' reaction, and it pleased God. And now God is working with him even more. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Holiness is always involved in experience with God. Keep that thought in mind. Good. Number six. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid. God scares people. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's not a bad thing. People need to be afraid of God. I wish there was more fear of God in our country today. Right. It'd be a whole lot different, wouldn't it? Yes, if there was enough. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Okay, there's Moses' experience. Now let's turn to the New Testament, Book of Acts. Book of Acts for Paul's experience. You see the similarities here. When someone really has an experience with God, when they really do, it's not a false one, it's a real one. What they experience and what changes. Acts chapter number 9, beginning verse 1. Here's Paul's experience with God. Acts 9, 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went up to the high priest. Well, I saw he was motivated yeah. against Christians. Yeah. Now verse 2. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, meaning any Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Here's the exciting part. Here it is. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? When, he, when people persecute Christians, they're persecuting Jesus Christ. Verse 5. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? That's interesting, the word Lord there. And the Lord said, I am Jesus. Who is the Lord? Jesus. Amen. Who is Jesus? He's the Lord. Amen. Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prince. And he trembling. Notice his reaction here. Trembling. Have you ever been so afraid of something that you literally trembled from fear? Few people have ever had that kind of fear. Few people have. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? To do. What do you want me to do? Right. I'm willing to do anything. And the Lord said to him, Rise, go into the city, they will told thee what thou must do, what you must do. That's the second one. Turn to Isaiah chapter number six now. Another experience we've got. See the similarities. Have the understand the conditions. What happens when a person really has an experience with God? What happens to distinguish the real from the false? Isaiah chapter six, beginning of verse one. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The Lord gave Isaiah a special vision here, a special sight, sighting. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain two he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried out to another and said, there's that word again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. God the Father is holy. God the Son is holy. God the Holy Spirit is holy. Verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me. What was his reaction when he saw God? It wasn't one of joy. It wasn't one of happiness at all. He said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, let me say this. So what? You know, we're surrounded by lost people. Okay, okay. But our own sin, don't let, uh, don't let the people around us 
make us not understand that we're guilty ourselves. It doesn't matter what other people do. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. Verse 5 again, verse 5. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That was his reaction. That was his reaction. Whether it's Isaiah, whether it's Paul, or Moses, or Job. Let's say open to Isaiah. That'll be my main verse today. Heavenly Father, please help me as I continue to preach this morning. That these experiences that people are saying they're having, they don't meet the Bible conditions. So help us to have wisdom in these areas. Help us to have discernment in these areas. So we know what uh, an experience with you is real, and when it's not real, help us to understand the difference there, please. Help me as I preach. Please bless and help me as I preach. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. Different things about this. Many are claiming to have experiences with God, but they do not meet the Bible conditions. First of all, what's the first condition? He experiences the holiness of God. He experiences the glory of God. The seraphim saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Today we have a, sal a salvation being preached. We have churches that bring this up, that you can be a Christian without having any kind of personal holiness or change in your life. It doesn't matter how you live before you, you were saved. It doesn't really matter how you live before you're saved. And, but it doesn't matter how you live after you're saved either. But I'm saying, if God's holiness is not involved in a person's salvation, if God's holiness is not involved in a person's experience with God, it's not the right kind of experience. It's not a Bible experience. There's got to be holiness involved in that. There needs to be guilt. I'll be talking about that. But the holiness of God is involved in all of these. When you see God, you see His holiness. If your God is not holy, He's not the God of heaven. He's not the God of the Bible. He experiences the holiness and glory of God. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. I can't tell you, I've been saved now over 50 years, 52 years, 52 and a half years I've been saved now. Amen. The things I've seen, the things I've heard, that just aren't real Christianity. Preach. Because they don't have holiness attached right. to it. Uh, people don't change their lifestyle yeah. after they get saved. They still want to go to the same bars after they got saved. They still want to go to the same churches after they got yeah. saved. Get out of those wrong churches. Get out of the churches that don't have holiness in them. The holiness of God should be involved in this and should cause us to look at God and to look down upon ourselves and humble ourselves before Him. When we see how holy God is, That's right. no man shall see God and what does the Bible say? And live. Yeah. Because His holiness is so powerful. Uh, in the Old Testament there, Moses wanted to see God. He said, well, I'll let you see a little bit of me. Hide behind these rocks here. Hide in the cleft of the rock here. I'll let you see a little bit of my glory, my honor. Because no man can see God and live. That's how holy God is. That's how powerful it is. The holiness of God. We need to experience, understand, any experience with God is going to include holiness. It's going to come, uh, include our, our conviction of our sin because we see ourselves and we say, like I said here, oh, woe is me, for I am undone. You don't start to think your good works are to get to heaven. Well, I don't want to get ahead of myself here either. But number one, any experience with God has to include holiness. God's holiness as it's reflected on us. On us. Will it make us feel guilty? Will it humble us? Will it scare us? I'm going to talk about that scaring thing. Good. I think that's interesting. So number one, any real experience with God will include holiness in some way, shape, or form. These people that say they're saved, but they're not living a holy life. Where's God in that? That's right. Where's the holy God in that? Why do we bring that up? Because I want these people to know and realize where they are spiritually. Good. They're not saved. Good. They're not born again. The holiness of God has not made a difference in their life. And if it's real salvation, there will be a difference. Amen. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, I like that word behold. Notice this. Yeah. All things become new. Yeah. Behold, look at that. Yeah. Look at the new things in a person's life. Good. Number two. Yeah. What's the second thing? When a man really sees God, he experiences an awareness of his own sin. The Bible is like a spiritual mirror that shows us for what we 
what we really are. Uh, and Job, yeah, turn to Job. Don't lose Isaiah. Let's turn back to Job, yeah, chapter 42. Job 42, verse 5 and 6. Where do you see this in people today? Oh, these kind of things we need to say. There are some strong words here, Job 42, verse 5. Job says here in 42, 5, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. Now, I heard about you, Lord, but now my eyes see in thee. This is an experience with God, isn't it? I've heard about you, but now I see you. Now, what reaction did he have when he saw God here? In this sense, what was his reaction? How did he respond? Verse 6. Wherefore, I abhor myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, when people are being brought into conviction by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, they will not like themselves. They'll realize and see their own sin. I abhor myself. Some people are trying to attack self-esteem with salvation. Mm -hmm. Wow, great fact. Oh, be careful of that. Yeah. Be careful of that kind of psychology there. Yeah. Job says here, I abhor, when he saw God and told us, he said, I abhor myself. Right. He didn't bring, bring, uh, build me up my self-esteem. Right. Uh, he didn't do that at all. It brought me down. I abhor myself. And nowhere does it say God, God says you shouldn't feel that way. No, we should feel that way. Amen. And repent, I repent. Praise the Lord, he repented. Amen. He wanted to change, he wanted to true God here. Amen. I repent in dust and ashes. I'm repenting, I'm repenting, I'm repenting. What does that mean? Well, it means you repent. <laughs> you mean you turn from your sin. There's a tiger. We're not talking sinless perfection. You know, I say that all the time. But there is the need of repentance. The need of repentance. I abhor myself and I repent. I repent, I repent, I repent, I repent, I repent. Why am I saying that? For all the churches that don't say it. Amen. 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 Good. And there's a lot of it around. That's right. Preach. So we're going to say it a lot of times here because they don't say it in the churches where they should be saying That's it. Right. Repentance is part of salvation. That's no right. repentance, no salvation. Amen. Unless you abhor yourself. You understand that you are a sinner. You come under that guilt. Yeah. Uh, he experienced an awareness of his own sin. The Bible is like a spiritual mirror. Uh, Isaiah again, oh, woe is me, woe is me. That's the reaction. When people have an experience with God, that's the reaction. It's not, oh, praise the Lord, all these wonderful things. No, that comes shortly thereafter you get saved. There's such a sense of relief. Yeah. You know, when you know your sins are forgiven. Uh, you've had this, I abhor myself, as Job says here. I abhor myself, oh, woe is me, as Isaiah said. And Paul kneeling down there, oh, Lord, who are you? You know, they, they humble themselves before him. And then God works with them, and then there's a joy and rejoicing. But not before the first part. The first part has to be there. The Bible is like a spiritual mirror. It experiences the awareness of our own sin. And by the way, your sin might not be the same as somebody else's sin before they were saved. My sin might not be the same as your sin before we were saved, if you're saved this morning. There's different sins, different things, but we all, all need to repent of those sins. So second point here, he experiences an awareness of his, his own sin. Don't blame other people. Don't try to justify it by saying, I wasn't raised in a good family. Or, I didn't have the right kind of influence around me. Or, I went here or I went there, whatever it is. Don't try to blame anybody else. If you're still blaming somebody else and trying to blame somebody else, you're never going to get saved. Until a person realizes that it's my fault. I cannot blame anybody else even a little even a little. Awareness of his own sin. Stop blaming other people. That's good. So he experiences the awareness of his own sin. Point number three. Point number three, back to Isaiah. He experiences a fear of God. Good. I, God ought to scare people. Yep. People who are not scared of God scare me. Mm. Isn't that good? People that don't that God doesn't that don't uh, that God doesn't scare scare me, scare me. Beware of these things. There needs to be a a, a fear of God. That's right. This is the most serious thing in the world. That's why I get sometimes disheartened. I need a revival. I get discouraged because I want to get more people out of the church. I want to get the gospel. And I think our church is doing a good job in that too. Getting out the gospel in the world, our society around here too. 
But I want to get more people into the church also. Yeah. It's like when Moses saw that special thing and he turned around and went back there. He was curious about that. And that, God, that, that uh, pleased God. That Moses went back there and then God saw that curiosity which turned into, into a sincerity, which turned into his salvation, which turned into his service too. And all began right there in that one place. When, when Moses decided to go back and look at that situation, what a difference that one little decision made. What brings such a relief in? But the fear of God. I wish I could scare people enough into getting saved. We try to. Try to talk about how bad hell is, and it's it's as bad as we say it is, and a whole lot worse than that. That's right. Wish I could get people scared about those things. That even motivates us, doesn't it, Christian? We think about people going to hell, dying, and going to hell forever, and it motivates us to witness and pray for people to get saved. And our heart goes out to them, and to think that Jesus Christ loves them even more than we did, or do. We loves them more than even we do. He loved them so much he died for them so they wouldn't have to go there. That's how much God loves people. Yeah. Would you be willing to die for somebody if you knew it meant guaranteed their salvation? Would you be willing to die for somebody else if you knew for sure? Now, we don't know for sure, but just a thought. Just a thought there. Uh, fear of God. Paul, Acts chapter 9, verse 6, we read about that. Trembling, trembling, astonished and trembling. Those two things. That's his reaction. He got afraid of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a real man. He had his spunk, didn't he? He went around and what he believed and what he uh, what he believed, what he was convinced of. He went around, he followed through on what he thought about, what he believed. He did that. He persecuted the church. But but he fell down before this vision that he had of God, trembling. Trembling. I think everybody, before they get saved, has to be go through this experience of a, a fearfulness of God. A fearfulness that we are under His holy judgment. Yeah. The eternal God. The eternal God who made everything. We're under His judgment. That ought to scare us. That ought to scare us. I know preachers, they try, try to preach uh, fear and they should do that. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Uh, but so many people, they just don't have a fear of God. We should be so serious about this. People need to understand these things. Paul trembled when he said that. I said, oh, woe is me. And look what Job said about himself. Too. The fear that they had, the, the humbling that uh, caused them. They got afraid of God. That's not a bad thing. I wish people were more scared of God. If people were more scared of God, we'd have more, more people, people come out to church. If we had more people scared about God, they'd be calling us on the phone at our church, or they'd be talking to you. If you were working at a job somewhere, you're the only Christian there, and they got scared about God, they'd come up to you. They want to talk to you. You wouldn't have to force yourself upon them. I wish people would get scared about God. Amen. Amen. And they really got yeah, so scared that they came out to church or read the Bible, read that track again, and were talked to you. Amen. You know, I think what we see happening in our nation is I think God's judgment trying to scare some people. Yeah. Things are getting worse. They're getting, people are getting scared. They need to get scared God's way. Yeah, that's right. yeah, you know, that's right. Towards God. Because yeah. God wants people to go to heaven so much. Yeah. He'll take everything we have in this world if that means to look to Him sincerely. It takes removing everything we have to really get saved. It's worth it. Yep. Yep. Giving everything we have, giving everything we have, if that would mean salvation, it's worth it. Amen. Nothing Amen. in this world is worth dying without Christ. Amen. Nothing is. Amen. So fear God. I wish people were more fearful about things. Another thing, another thought here, four point number four in my life. I like this one. He sees the sin in others. He sees the sin in other people, too. Here in verse number 5, back to, let's see, back to Isaiah. <clears throat> and a people, it talks about the people here. I lost my place. Let me get back to Isaiah chapter 6 myself also. Isaiah chapter number 6. The people, talking about the people. I'm a, a man of unclean lips. 
And in verse number five, it says here, Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am, I am a man of unclean lips. Here's my individual sin, my problem. I, I know I'm done wrong. I've done wrong. And, and not just that, not just personal, also the people around him. And, and I dwell, live, in the midst of a people of unclean lips. It's not just me, it's others too. He couldn't use the others as an excuse. I said that already. But he sees the sin in others. I guess an illustration of like when you go to the doctor sometimes, you don't see a problem, but they may be doing x-rays, done some kind of examination, and they find things wrong in you that you are not even aware of. Yeah. They find things wrong that you need to be aware of, need to be aware of, and, and uh, do something about it. But he sees the sin in other people too. You know, friends, Christians, when you get saved, you see the other people that are in the same condition, predicament, that you were before you got saved too. Don't you see that? Yes. And what's your now spiritual reaction? You want them to get saved also. Amen. You see the sin in other people. You see what's keeping them away from the Lord, whatever it might be. And there's many different things. But experience with God will cause people to see sin in other people too. You get, uh, when you first get, like when I first, I remember this, in junior high school, I went to the optometrist, the eye doctor. I knew my vision wasn't real good, so he, he went to the doctor and I put on my new glasses for the first time at that time. Junior high school, you know how bad that is. You know how much they make fun of you in junior high school when something like that happens. Well, anyway, so I didn't wear my glasses any more than I had to. But when I put on my glasses, wow, could I see that chalkboard in the front of the uh, classroom? Could I see a detail like I've never, ever seen before? I, I liked it. It was interesting. And I, I wore it all the time. Nobody kidded me too much about it. I thought that was good because well, some of them had wearing glasses too. Uh, but I went home one day. I remember I was walking back from, yeah, I was in junior high already, walking back East Boulevard there, walking back home. And I thought, oh, no, I lost my glasses somewhere. I thought, where did I leave my glasses? And I thought, I was wearing them. I was wearing them. I thought, why well, you get so used to it? You know, you only realize you're getting glasses. But I was getting back to my main point. When I put on the new glasses, I saw things I never saw before. I saw details I never saw before. I saw all kinds of things. I said, wow, what a wonderful world we live in here. How different it was. Same thing when a person gets saved. Now you see sin in other people. It's like putting on those spiritual glasses where you had blinders on before. Now you have glasses on. And you see in other people their sins. Some of the same sins that you had before you got saved yourself. Other sins. And you recognize that and you realize that and you try to tell them about it and they're blind to themselves. They need those glasses. They need salvation. Then they will see the same thing that you see. But when a person gets saved, it changes your opinion. That's not the best word. It changes the way you look at other people. You recognize their sicknesses spiritually. You recognize what they don't have. You recognize they're going the wrong way. You see the sin in other people. Let me take this a little step further. Because we see the sin in this world, Christians don't live in an, or have an unrealistic outlook on life. You know, the people in this world, they want to make this world so good. They take a stand for different issues and they want to help this out, they want to do that, and, and they march about different things. But as Christians, we don't expect a perfect world anymore. You know, when you're saved, you realize that this, like the Bible says, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. We don't expect perfection from our politicians anymore. Right. We don't per expect per perfection from anybody in this world anymore. And we don't have that unrealistic outlook about life. We realize this is a, a real, real world we live in. We have really, people are really, really sinners in this world. Uh, people really, really do wrong things. And it, it saddens us. We, we wish it was better, but we understand as Christians, we're not idealistic like that. We don't have an unrealistic outlook upon life. We realize, as like the Bible says, all have sinned to come short of the Lord of God, and this world is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Right, preacher. 
And we as Christians understand that, and so we don't look out upon this world and get down about it, because we realize this is reality. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says people aren't perfect. The Bible says people are uh, sinful. And so we don't have this unrealistic uh, outlook on life. We, don't, we realize that people are sinners. We realize that things aren't going to get better and not to spend our time trying to make this a better world. As one person said, a better world to go to hell from. But we don't spend our time trying to make this a better world. We try to get people saved. Amen. And then it's kind of a strange thing. Yeah. When a person gets saved, they become better. Right. Isn't that curious? Uh, what they're trying to accomplish, we accomplish by getting people saved. Amen. But we don't live in this outlook, this unrealistic outlook on life. We don't have that. Uh, we don't think that people are going to be good because they're sinners. Now, there's people that aren't all that bad. We can, maybe you have some old friends, you have different things like that. I'm not saying everybody's 100% sinner all the time. I'm not saying that at all. People know the difference, and they may be made to do what's right. That's why we have, that's why we have police and jails. Because people aren't going to do right on their own many times, and so they need to be uh, forced to do right or else. And there needs to be an or else. It really does. It needs to be in our else. So Christians don't have an unrealistic outlook on life. We realize people are sinners and that people are the way they are. It's going to be that way. We don't look for perfection in people. And we, therefore, we understand this world better than the world does. Even a better world. Don't become a Christian. Understand. Don't be unrealistic about this. This is a real world in which we live. Everybody has a past. Everybody has some things that they're ashamed about or Think about their old words. So what? I don't care what everybody's done in the past. It doesn't matter what anybody's done in the past. All I want to know is now what's your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and do you want to serve Him? That's all I'm interested in. Because everybody has a past. Everyone does. Don't expect a perfect world because we see the sin in other people. And then the last thought. He experiences a desire to serve God. What Paul did there in Acts. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Let's look up one more verse here this morning. Luke chapter number 22. Luke 22. Verse 27. So when a man sees God, what is a true biblical experience when he sees God? Holiness is about Holiness in many ways. Oh, God's holiness. He experiences uh, being confronted with his own sin that humbles him. Shames him. He experiences the fear of God. He becomes scared of God. He takes it seriously. He sees the sin in others, too. This, this whole world is just one ugly mess. Yeah. Well, that's not a spiritual way to say it, is it? It's true. But it really is. Then he experiences a desire to serve. Luke chapter 22, verse 27. Luke 22, verse 27. The Lord speaking here. For when there is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I, I am among you as he that serveth. Mm -hmm. Now who's the greater one? The one that's serving or the one that's being served? Well, in this world's estimation, the greater one is the one who is being served. Mm -hmm. But the Lord says, I am one that he that serveth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to serve, I'm not going to be served, I'm going to serve others. Now, the Lord's going to be glorified that day is coming up. The Lord should be glorified in all our lives now, for that matter. But interesting what the Lord says here. Back up to verse 25 now. Amen. Luke 22, verse 25. And he, the Lord, said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Yet they like to the kings, the political figures, like they have authority over people. Yeah. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Uh, but ye shall not be so. Don't be like this. Jesus says, don't be like this. Don't be like the world that wants an honor and glory. But he shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, that means in God's sight, he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, let as he that thou serve. Don't try to, for those high positions there. For Again, verse 27. Now, for whether is greater, he that sitteth in me, or he that serveth, greater in this world's estimation is they that are served. Not those that serve, but in God's sight, those that are greater, those that 
serve. Serve. Is not he that sinneth me, but I am among you as he that serveth. And who's our example? The Lord Jesus Christ. And what does the Lord do here? Serves. So if we're following the, the, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will need to serve. Turn one more verse, and I'm, I'm done this morning. Second, let's see, Second Corinthians. Uh, like, uh, yeah, Second Corinthians chapter five. I like that word "behold" again. I just want to say this: What are we talking about? What's the message this morning? When a man really sees God, when a person really has an experience, a real experience with God, it will follow the examples of experiences of God that the Bible gives. Job is an example. Moses is an example. Paul is an example. Isaiah is an example. Yeah. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let's see, I'm going to, let's see, verse number seven, not 7, there, there, ah, I'm losing my, I it when this happens, let's see. Therefore, 17, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. With this thought, here's an experience with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, therefore, if any man be in Christ, in that experience of salvation, he is a new creature. Yep. A new creature. Here's an experience, salvation experience. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is. Not will be, is. A new creature. All things are passed away. Amen. Things from the past change. Now that we're behold, notice, look at this. Behold, look at this. Notice this. Behold, all things are become new. Amen. When somebody has a real experience with God in salvation, here it is. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. One of our most familiar verses in our church here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, look at this. Look at these things. Behold, all things have become new. Before you got saved, most of you did not go to a Baptist church. Right? Before you got saved, all of you did not live the way you're living now. God makes a difference. Salvation makes a difference. Jesus Christ makes a difference. That's the experience with God. Salvation is one of those experiences with God. Just like Isaiah, just like Moses, just like Paul, just like Joe, and just like me, and just like you. Amen. If you're born again today, if you're not born again, you need to be. Get scared about it. Get scared about it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Yes. I pray you work in people's hearts. People have experienced so-called experience with God, but they don't meet the Bible criteria. They don't change the person towards holiness. They don't scare the person to, to humble themselves before you. Or the, the Bible criteria of conditions are just not there. Help us to understand that and recognize that. We pray for them. Lord, we pray for them. Please work in their hearts. Bless now we have a time of invitation, a time of prayer, a time when we invite people to come forward and pray about things for themselves, for different things, different people, or maybe someone, maybe somebody who walked in the aisle this morning to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to humble themselves. Maybe this message has you know, scared them a little bit. I wish I could scare them a lot. I wish I could scare everybody to get saved. But they have their will. I pray that this morning, though, some will choose the right way. So please bless this prayer time. Please bless this invitation time. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask it. Amen.